Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Christine Chubbuck? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I'll put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. So first I'll go through the background of Christine Chubbuck. I'll look at the incident that occurred in this story and then I'll offer my analysis. Christine Chubbuck was born in Hudson, Ohio on August 24, 1944. Her father's name was George and her mother's name was Peg. She had two brothers. She was the middle child. She attended a school for girls in Cleveland. Chubbuck was depressed and had mood swings. She was treated by mental health professionals. She was interested in finding a romantic interest but did not have much success. In high school, she started a group she called the Dateless Wonder Knitting Club. At age 16, she started dating a man who was 23, but he would die in an automobile collision shortly after this. In 1965, she would earn a degree in broadcasting from Boston University. She went to work for a television station in Cleveland and then for another one in Canton. After this, she worked for a station in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. She had moved there to be with a romantic interest, but the relationship did not last. She quit this job and worked as a computer operator for a hospital for four years and then worked for a cable television company for two years. This was in Florida. She made her way back into broadcasting by working for a station in St. Petersburg and then took a job with WXLT, which was an ABC affiliate. The owner of the station was a man named Bob Nelson. Even though he hired Chubbuck as a reporter, he eventually gave her a talk show called Suncoast Digest. The show was supposed to give attention to those concerned with lost segments of the community. The station was not sophisticated. It was a small station without a lot of technology. Reporters were given Polaroid cameras and told to go find stories. The pictures they took were taped to a board, and the camera would pan over the pictures as the stories were read on air. Their audience was not substantial. Suncoast Digest, for example, only averaged about 500 viewers on most mornings. Pressure to build a bigger audience predictably led to chasing sensationalistic stories. The motto of the station became, if it bleeds, it leads. Chubbuck lived in Siesta Key, Florida, in a cottage owned by her family. She decorated the interior of her bedroom to make it look like a teenager's room. Her mother and younger brother moved in with her after her mother divorced her father. Her younger brother moved out, but then her elder brother moved in. Chubbuck, her mother, and her elder brother got along quite well. However, Chubbuck was having a number of mental health problems, so similar problems to what we saw earlier in her life. I'll cover more about this in the analysis. In early July 1974, Chubbuck purchased a Smith & Wesson Model 36. This is a revolver chambered in 38 caliber. Now moving to July 15, 1974. The show, Suncoast Digest, was getting ready to start that morning. Chubbuck told the workers in the studio that she needed to read something during the opening of the show. This was out of the ordinary. This is the first time she ever asked to change the format in this way. Chubbuck sat at the desk of the news anchor as the guest for the show waited in an interview area. For about eight minutes, she read a newscast covering three national stories and a local story about a shooting that occurred at a restaurant. This segment had a clip that was supposed to run, but it jammed. Chubbuck continued and said, In keeping with Channel 40's policy of bringing you the latest in blood and guts and in living color, you are going to see another first, an attempted suicide. She used a sarcastic tone to say blood and guts and in living color, she was looking directly at the camera and smiling tentatively. Her left hand was shaking and her right arm stiffened as she spoke those words. She quickly produced her revolver, placed it behind her right ear, and discharged it. Chubbuck fell forward into the desk and then slid out of her chair onto the floor. The broadcast was faded to black by the technical director, but not in time to prevent what happened from being broadcast. At first, people in the studio were angry because they thought Chubbuck was joking. They soon realized this was not a joke. 
Several people in the community called the police and the station. Chubbuck would be pronounced dead 14 hours later after being taken to Sarasota Memorial Hospital. Now moving to my analysis. Chubbuck was being treated by a mental health professional, specifically a psychiatrist. She saw the clinician last just a few weeks before she died. She used to talk to her mother and brother about how she was depressed and feeling suicidal. There were specific items she talked about. Chubbuck had difficulty with romantic relationships. She was going to turn 30 soon, and she never had been on more than two dates with a man, and she had never had sex. She had overdosed on drugs in 1970 and would bring that up as a topic of conversation frequently. She never explicitly told her family about a specific plan to bring an end to her life. Chubbuck used to frequently put herself down, referring to herself as dateless, as she had done when she was in high school. Amplifying her concerns about finding a romantic partner was the time pressure put on her by a recent operation. About a year before her death, her right ovary was removed. The physician told her that if she wanted to conceive, she only had two or three years to do it. After that, she would probably never become pregnant. It was also reported that Chubbuck was romantically interested in a man named George Peter Ryan. He worked at the station with her. She referred to him as Gorgeous George. For his birthday, Chubbuck baked him a cake. She was trying to get his attention. He was already romantically involved with another co-worker named Andrea Kirby. Chubbuck knew Kirby well and felt crushed to lose to a romantic competitor. Chubbuck had talked to the night news editor about her suicidal thoughts, telling him that she had purchased a firearm and was thinking about committing suicide on air. The editor changed the subject. He believed it was simply Chubbuck trying to be funny, kind of a sick sense of humor. Chubbuck's mother had considered telling the management at the television station about the suicidal thoughts, but she figured they would simply fire her and make things worse. On the day of Chubbuck's death, she appeared to be in an extremely good mood, according to her mother. She told her mother that she would be back by 10.45 a.m. This is expected when a person decides to commit suicide, their mood often gets better because they believe the end of their suffering is near. After Chubbuck's death, her mother would tell reporters that Chubbuck was terribly, terribly, terribly depressed. Chubbuck loved her job, but she had nothing else in her social life. She had no close friends, no romantic attachments, no prospects. Chubbuck was sensitive, and she would try to reach out, but she was not successful. She just couldn't connect with people. Her mother also claimed that the mental health professional who was treating Chubbuck did not think that Chubbuck was serious about not wanting to live. Chubbuck was highly self-critical. She would not accept praise from anybody. She was defensive and would become distant when people tried to be friendly to her or pay her compliments. Looking at the personality profile for Chubbuck, she appeared to be high in openness to experience. She was intellectually curious. For example, she had a number of interests growing up. Like she would get into something, but then she would give it up. So perhaps she was becoming bored as well. She was creative. She used to put on puppet shows. And she tended to experience emotions intensely. We see that Chubbuck was high in conscientiousness. She was a hard worker. She wanted to do a good job at the TV station. She was low in extroversion. She wasn't particularly friendly or outgoing. And she tended to have low positive emotions. We see mid-range to low agreeableness. She clearly was willing to compete and didn't get along with people all the time. But in other ways, she was altruistic. So again, overall, probably a little low, but not very low. As far as neuroticism, we see that Chubbuck did have a number of negative emotions. She was depressed and perhaps sometimes anxious. She also seemed a bit insecure. As far as mental health, I'm not aware of any reports about specific diagnoses. Many believe, of course, that Chubbuck was depressed. There are many reasons this theory seems reasonable. She reported that she was depressed many times. She was treated by mental health professionals for symptoms of depression. She had a suicide attempt in 1970, where she overdosed on prescription medication. Ultimately, she did die by suicide in 1974. She had longed for romantic relationships, but was unsuccessful, and she did not feel satisfied in her career. The next question is, why did Chubbuck choose to die by suicide 
on air. Obviously, this is pretty unusual. It never happened prior to Christine Chubbuck. The motivation to die could certainly be all the symptoms of depression that I talked about. The question becomes, why do it publicly? What was her objective? There are a few theories. I'll go through three here. More than one of these could be at play at the same time. They're not mutually exclusive. The first theory, it was to protest the TV station's policy of chasing sensationalistic stories. This may have been a factor, but I don't think it was a major factor. I think Chubbuck wanted to make it appear as though this was the reason to tie her behavior to something larger, to connect it to a more significant story. Theory number two, Chubbuck lived a life of trying to get attention. She wanted to be recognized romantically and for her talent as a reporter. She largely failed in both ways. With her actions on July 15, 1974, people would have to notice her. Now she would get the attention that she had wanted from everybody. Theory number three, perhaps this was an expression of pain, of isolation. Even if it was just for a moment, she wanted everybody to face her pain, to empathize with her, to understand her. Chubbuck was described as socially awkward. She was unable to connect with people. Perhaps this was a way of trying to connect, of finally having people kind of turn their heads and look at her and notice her. I think the sequence of events for Chubbuck's behavior went something like this. Chubbuck was suicidal for a long time. In addition to symptoms of depression, Chubbuck had dichotomous thinking. She tended to see life in extremes. If her life wasn't very good, it must have been very bad in her way of thinking. After a string of what she viewed as defeats, she categorized her life as horrible. She wanted to get more information about how to bring an end to her life, so she obtained permission from the TV station to do a story about suicide where she interviewed a police officer. The officer gave her the idea of the method that she would ultimately use. She probably thought about it and realized that was something she could do on the air. I think much of the reaction to Christine Chubbuck's story falls along the lines of, here's a person that no one listened to. No one wanted to help. She was in plain sight asking for help, but was ignored. The reality is a bit different. Chubbuck's family invested a lot of resources in getting help for her. She saw a number of mental health professionals. Her communication with her family was relatively open, including her feelings of suicide and depression. It sounds as though her family did everything they could do. It was like watching a slow-moving automobile collision. They knew there was risk, but they didn't know how to stop it. Today's video is sponsored by HelloFresh. HelloFresh offers a wide variety of recipes. If you feel like you're stuck in a rut, HelloFresh could be the way to go. They always have something new to mix things up. It adds a lot of variety to mealtime. It really makes my week a lot easier. I'm busy making videos and conducting research for videos. So it's nice just to be able to go downstairs, read the instructions, and have the ingredients right there ready to go. When I can save time, that means more videos for my audience. Going to the grocery store simply takes too much time, and a lot of the ingredients I buy there, I end up wasting. With low fresh, that doesn't happen. There's no waste, and my prep time is kept to a minimum. Feeding my entire family is like feeding a small crowd. The larger box sizes at HelloFresh make that easy. HelloFresh is generous. They donated over 4 million meals in 2020 alone. Go to HelloFresh.com and use code DRGRANDE12 to get 12 free meals, including free shipping. Again, to get 12 free meals, go to HelloFresh.com and use the code DRGRANDE12. Now moving to the lessons learned. The case of Christine Chubbuck was tragic. There are many lessons. I will cover three here. First lesson what really stood out in this case was the isolation. Chubbuck had some connections with people, but not in the area of romance. Her situation wasn't as clear as she was approaching other people and those people were rejecting her. Some reports indicate that when people were romantically interested in her, she created the distance. It was not about rejection, but rather about a disconnect. She could not navigate romantic situations. Second lesson, as I mentioned, one of the concerns that Chubbuck's mother had was that if she told her daughter's employer about the suicidal thoughts, her daughter would have been fired. I don't know what would have happened, but there was certainly a risk of that happening. 
in 1974, firing a person for being suicidal was not against the law. Under most circumstances these days, it probably would be, for example, under the American with Disabilities Act. But in reality, that's very difficult to enforce as far as employment matters, and in some ways, as far as really anything the law covers. The reality is that employers cannot be counted on to help with mental illness. Their tendency is to dispose of people with mental health conditions as if those people are liabilities. This creates a dangerous situation for everyone. It doesn't help the person with the disorder. It doesn't help society. The employers are simply behaving in antisocial and narcissistic manners. Laws are on the books, but without enforcement, they aren't very helpful. If somebody was driving through an area and there was a sign that said the speed limit was 35, and they realized they were doing 55, but then they saw a sign that said speed limit never enforced, they probably wouldn't worry about it too much. That's what's happening with mental health and employment. Moving to the third lesson, even if the intervention from mental health professionals did not seem to be successful in the case of Christine Chubbuck, usually treatment is effective. If somebody is struggling with depression or any mental health symptoms, mental health treatment will often alleviate those symptoms. The stigma surrounding seeking mental health care is certainly real, but it is not logical. Rather, it is simply the result of a lack of empathy for those who are suffering. Those are my thoughts on the case of Christine Chubbuck. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be interesting. Thanks for watching.